I'm going to continue to develop the piece now and I'm satisfied with this. I wanted it sketchy. I didn't want to get bogged down in detail and, and now I'd like to spend some time developing the rest of this piece that's dominated by a very very strong pattern of letters and geometric shapes. But I also want to take the opportunity to introduce a rather interesting method of paint application. When you look at the source that I'm using for this watercolor, little view of my studio, my painting easel area. You can see I work from a monitor. I have the monitor over there. Zoom in on the source. You see rather rich color combinations. Primary essentially and secondary. There's some greens thrown in there and I see a little bit of a purple. I'm going to introduce a method here where we allow our colors to intermix on the surface and rather than applying green and blue and yellow directly as you see it I'm going to have you start with the opposite color. Well, yellow will start out with purple. That will be very challenging to modulate the purple back to the yellow but your piece will take on a rich deep quality. The color the color won't look thin. It'll have character. I'll share a little paint that I'm working on right now too while we're doing it. It's the landscape watercolor. Combination of watercolor and acrylic on paper. It's on 300 pound arches watercolor paper. Okay, back to our work in progress. And we'll start out probably working with the most difficult color combination you can. Modulating a purple back to a yellow. Purple being sort of the complement of yellow. I'm going to wet the area where I intend to apply my, my paint. Why do I wet the area? I don't want the paint to sink in the paper and result in brush marks. I want a nice fluid application of color where the color rides the surface of the paper and leaves no brush strokes. So this is sort of prime in the paper. It's going to create a slight water barrier that will keep the paint on the surface. So the next step is to mix a little purple. Oh, I want a nice nice purple so or violet yeah. I'll take a little of this quinacridone magenta into the quinacridone magenta I'm going to add Antwerp blue there we go there's our Antwerp blue right there Then eventually, I'm going to flow my, my yellow into that to create the result that I want, which is a yellow area, not a purple area. But here, let's, let's go. Now what I don't want to have happen is I don't want this to start to dry then I have a problem. This will only work with wet painted into wet. If my color starts to dry, the purple is going to lock into the paper and I'm going to be stuck with it. I do not want that. So let me paint fast. See, I don't want to brush into it. I just want it to flow. I'm going to change the color temperature of my yellow to make this a more interesting area. Remember, I'm, I'm after interesting, beautiful, rich color areas. And 
what creates beautiful rich color areas? Variety. I put that there just to show you the difference when you don't have the complement. That's a much cleaner color, but just not nearly as expressive. All right, now what I'll do is I'll move this around. Let the color drip onto the sponge. See what's happening there? Let the sponge suck up the excess color. I'm gonna flow a little bit more yellow into that. We have yellow as our dominant color, but we still have hints. And basically those hints take on a brownish, purplish, and very natural feel. Now I could continue, I mean, let's cheat a bit. I could continue to enhance it by flowing more of that yellow into the surface until I get the uh, desired effect. But I'm not brushing in. I'm allowing the color to flow. Yes. And let's catch the runoff. I The reason why I'm doing that is I don't want the there'll be so much color on the surface that it will flow back into the paint and muddy everything. I want it to flow off. I'm priming the paper like you've seen me do back there. I want to get more yellow into here. Okay, we'll we'll get it right put it right about here and then flow in our purple. We can call it quits about there. Now, I'm going to go to my yellow once again, my Windsor Yellow. This is a really cold Windsor Yellow. I've got to check the name of that, see if it's something other than Windsor Yellow. More like a lemon yellow. We'll flow it in. Notice, I'm allowing the paint to flow on its own. Um, I'm trying to keep my brushwork minimal. Okay, now that I have rich applications of purple and yellow, I want to suck up some of that color. See, I want to I want to allow the color to to mix on its own, but I have to provide a conduit for it to get off the page. And this is how I go about doing that. I'll lift it out with my paintbrush.
Watercolor painting isn't all about paint application. Often it's about paint removal and how do we remove it. I, I would like to do a little flow here. So what I'll do is just wet the page so it continues on its own naturally. Then I can work into that later. I don't want it to dry as a sharp line. That's why I'm doing it. Now what I'll do is apply some more. Okay. Why am I doing this? Let me repeat. I'm doing this to create rich color areas that have a specific color dominating, but because of the intermixing, other secondary and tertiary colors appear. So I want a dynamically rich color statement. Example, if I just apply yellow as yellow, there we go. I mean, it works, but it's very primary. It's very just yellow. What I'm showing you here is a way where if you were doing a realistic image of, say, a uh, cityscape or a still life with fruit, this would be a good method to use to give your painting added richness and color depth. Apply the purple. We want the fluid action of the color to wash away the purple that's underneath. So what have we achieved here? Well, the yellow is dry. And you can see, it's, no doubt about it, it's yellow. But there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's uh, the remnants of the purple. I like the way, look, automatically the purple was pushed towards the edge of the dry letters. Remember, I didn't wet them, I wet around them. And I have these outlines now, outlines that created themselves. And this is a fairly rich looking color statement, as opposed to just the same yellow. Look at that. Now, for example, hypothetically, if you were painting a lemon, this would be the way to do it. This would not. This would give you the subtle colors that you see in the lemon skin, making it a rich, realistic paraphrasing of the original subject, whereas this is almost anemic by quality. Okay, what do we want to do next? Looking at the, uh, you know, an image up on my monitor, I have a yellow area there that I could fill in, but I'd rather not do that. I mean, you know, you know how to do that. Now you lay in your purple, you lay in your, the complement of the yellow, which is the purple, and you lay in your yellow on top of it while it's wet, and you push it around. Let's go to another primary. Yellow is a primary color, blue is a primary color, and red is a primary color. What does that mean? Well, what that means is they cannot be broken down into any other colors to make those colors. Red is red, yellow is yellow, and Blue is blue. They're like the atoms in the color world. They are the primary color use that can't be broken down any further, but they can be mixed, intermixed to create the entire spectrum of colors. For example, green is a combination of yellow and blue. If we had orange here in the hair, 
that would be a combination of red and yellow, and so on and so on. So what I would like to do next is lay in another primary color. Let's go to the red. And, and for the exercise in laying in the primary colors, we're going to start out with the opposite, their complement. So I'm going to lay in blue first and then flow my red in. Okay, let's begin by washing in some water. Yeah, we'll do this little area first. I'm going to wet it. I'm going to go, why don't I begin with a cold bowl flow? So I'll take my palette, mix up some cold bowl blue, and then that's fairly intense red, so I'll go from the cold bowl blue to the Windsor red. Wash in my cold bowl blue. Now I wouldn't want this to get into the paper. A little, I mean of course a little is going to get into the paper. But I, what I mean is I wouldn't want to apply this to dry paper because that would suck in in a way that would permeate the fiber of the paper and not allow me to do what I'm about to do. Now, having laid in the blue, clean that brush. I'm going to go to my Windsor Red right there. Wow. Surely a Spectrum Red. Look at the Cornacridone Magenta right next to it. Very different. Very beautiful color, actually. But here, copious quantity of red on my brush, and I'll, I'll wash it in. And I'm going to let it run off. Notice how it hugs around that part of the number one. I'm going to keep on doing it until I wash out a lot of that blue. That's why it's important to do this on an angle. It's not the easiest thing to pull off, depending on what kind of a painting you're working on. I'm going to suck up. Yeah. And I'll do, I can keep on going with this until I get the exact amount of red that I like. That looks good. Move it around a bit. Actually, if I want to fairly intense red. I can leave it right like that. Now, where does that continue? That continues up and around, so why don't I attempt to do this area? So notice, the point I want to make is the primary, in the primary colors I start with the complement, although I want the primary that you see to dominate, it gives the primary added richness by starting with the complement because little, little particles of the complement remain uh, visible on the paper. Okay, go to my cobalt blue, I'm gonna wash that in. This is a little trickier now. This is an isolated colors detail. So I'm not going to be able to, to let it run off the page like I did over there. Somehow or another though, I'm going to have to manage to make it work. That's with the red float in. That's just a cobalt blue. Now I'm going to Go to my red and let it do its thing. It's 
what's going to happen though, I'm going to get a lot of buildup in here of color that I am going to have to remove one way or another. I think I mentioned this, uh, a good way to remove, to suck up color from your painting is with Kleenex. Kleenex is a wonderful tissue, very absorbent, and it'll, it'll take the color right out. I don't have Kleenex in my studio tonight, and I'm not going back out there, it's freezing, and the snow is too deep. So, look what the brush does though. The brush can function like a color vacuum cleaner, uh, a, a pigment vacuum cleaner. Look at that, lifts it right up. Of course, that's a little too blue. I wanna push this color area to my red. I also want to be careful that I don't get a huge drip flowing down the side of my paper. Having sucked it up, I'm going to rinse my brush off in the clean water again and then go back to suck up more. Same thing there. Look at that. I should use a little of that there. In fact, I could take that there and put that there. It's a very nice red. See, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to teach you a little bit about the, the interaction of color and color mixing. Okay. I am going to do apply another wash right here. Let it bleed down and right here. See, I think you get the idea. I continue to repeat this until I achieve what I want to achieve. I can even lay it flat now, being happy with the, the particle concentration of cobalt blue in the paper. And I could, I could just apply a wash. And instead of allowing it to run, allow it to lay flat of my red. And I have a fairly rich red color statement that creates for a much rich color statement. For example, when I apply the green, I'm not going to put down green. This is secondary color. So I'm going to start out with blue and then flow yellow into the blue to make my green. And anywhere, I don't have any other secondaries in here, but if I did, for example, if I, have it, if I had orange, I'd start out with red and flow my yellow into my red to create the secondary. Let's add our green, but by mixing the green directly on the paper and mixing it in a fluid fashion. That is, first I'm gonna dampen the paper I consider this prime in the paper, get it ready for the application of color. Now to create green, I'm going to take the blue, I've thought about the blue, I'm just not grabbing a random blue, I'm using Antwerp blue here for a specific reason, I want to get that type of green. So I apply my Antwerp blue to the primed paper. Then I'm going to go to, I 
actually this is Windsor Yellow Medium it's a warmer Windsor Yellow than the Windsor Yellow I use for this and I flow in and then what I love is to move it around now if I want to make it a greener green although that's a nice green the way it is but here let me show you I can suck out some pigment with my paintbrush my paint vacuum cleaner look at that it really just it has to be a damp brush but it'll pull that pigment right up I'm gonna leave it I like that let's, let's do another one that was fun this time let's change our green let's go from the Antwerp blue that we used to mix to a cobalt blue good I have some cobalt in my palette get the uh, the blue ready there it is cobalt blue right there and I'm gonna mix it it's a much more atmospheric blue than the Antwerp blue the Antwerp blue if blue could be a warm blue that's a warm blue I mean blue is by its very nature it's considered a cool color but I'm stretching the definition of warm and cool here prime it Blow in my cobalt blue. Make sure I clean up that brush. Then I'm going to go to my Windsor Yellow. This time I'm going to go to my cooler Windsor Yellow. One right here. See that right there? Ooh, I just got some red in there. So much for cool. I warmed it up a bit, but it's still yellow. And I'm gonna flow it in. Tilt my paper and flow it. And rotate a little this way. I could it could affect where the the paint is going to go. And now I'll, I'll suck into it. Absorb it with my nice damp paintbrush. Another application is in order. So I'm going to go to my cool yellow. Like we just did. Flow it in. I want to try to get a little bit of a lighter green here. Having fun with this. Realize, the, I mean, a picture will result, but what I'm really doing is experimenting with color and experimenting with mixing. already you could see the difference this is a cooler green than that that's a warmer deeper green this is a lighter feeling green I just finished laying in all my my greens using the method of applying blue first and then flowing a yellow in on top of it and then gently moving it around as you can see it's still wet
We'll let that dry now and then continue with what color should we continue with? Blue. We'll do the blue triangles in the blue center and in order to achieve a blue I'll start with a base of red and then flow my blue on top of that. The watercolor is nice and dry now and I just laid in the green and as we discussed we used the complementary approach I, lay, I applied my blue first and then I washed yellow on top of that and if you notice each one of these has a very interesting color signature it's not just flat green there's a lot of variation going on this has a really nice marbleized effect here we have an interesting run occurring and that's the beauty of this technique you don't get a flat color you get a rich color look at the red here and I still have the option of intensifying all these colors which I'll talk about when I'm finished the piece so what I plan to do next is work in my blues these blues right over here and and the way I'm gonna go about doing that since blue is a pure color and primary color and I can't create blue by mixing two different colors so I want to use the complementary wash technique for the blue. Let's begin with a base of red and then we're going to flow the blue on top of that. Remember to create the red I started with a base of blue and I flowed the red in on top of that and gave a lot of character to the red wash. So let's see what happens with the blue. Okay back at my painting. Since a little bit of time has passed I'm to, I need to re-wet some colors and what colors here? My Antwerp blue and my red is ready to go so let's prime a section this is a nice little area right about here wet it I'm going to tackle each one at a time because I find by taking my time and doing it that way I get more interesting variations and that's what I want to create. I want to create a rich surface, rich colorful surface. I'm going to work in my red. Now, into that, I'm going to flow blue. A lot of water contained in that little area, so I definitely, before I, I could achieve any effective results, need to lift some of that water out. I don't want it to run, though, into the green. I almost started doing that. Okay. Maybe I'll approach it from this side. That makes more sense. I'm going to let that set up now. We could do another one. You know, let's take this end one. Paper primed. I'm going to switch my wash to. I'm going to still use red but why not have a little bit more fun? I'm going to throw in a 
magenta. Cornacridone magenta. I'm doing this. I'm using the same blue, but I'm I'm, inter I'm I'm flowing in the magenta to be able to create variations on my blue. It's going to result in a very different blue, and I'm experimenting. I'm having fun, and that's what I want you to do. Let's see what kind of a blue we get. Remember, the mixing has occurred by movement, not by brushwork. we have to provide an an exit point so let's do it right there that is a very strong rich colorful looking blue lots of red going on I like what's happening along the edge we look at the other one a more subdued natural looking blue Well, I'm going to continue laying in the blue washes and play around with these variations. I encourage you to do the same thing in yours. And we'll come back to this when everything is dry, when all the blue is dry and it's finished up. Thank you. 